We're going to start because uh, Al Campbell, who organized this uh, session on behalf of the Union of Radical Political Economy, um, kindly arranged for this panel to critique my book, which is uh, The Long Depression here, by Michael Roberts. Uh, and I managed to invite two other speakers, Paul Matic, who may well be known to you in Marx economic circles pretty well, who uh, has kindly come on to present his critique of the book. Uh, for those who don't know, I think Paul's book on the Great Recession and the financial crash called Business as Usual is probably the best book uh, on the whole of that event that you can see of all the many books, including my own, that have written about that. Uh, one of the reasons is it is very clear in its analysis and also short, uh, which is a big advantage when we're trying to understand the process without wading through all the academic stuff. We also have uh, Jose Tapia here, who also has written a book on the Great Recession with Rolando Astarita, a very good book in Spanish. So you're, uh, those who have got the, the lingo should definitely get a copy of that book. And he has a new one coming out. It's out already, I think, is it? It's out already. It's out already, also in Spanish. So uh, again, this dealing with the, with the whole process of the causes of, cri of crises under capitalism from a Marxist perspective. And that's really what uh, my book is about. I call it The Long Depression. And uh, it's also in Spanish now, uh, just recently released in Madrid. Uh, so for the Spanish speakers as well, the second most important language after the language of imperialism, uh, the English, um, is now available. Um, so what is this book about and what's new about it as far as I'm concerned? Well, there are perhaps five or six different things which I think are different in the book from other books about this particular period of crisis under capitalism. I'll explain. The first one is hidden in the title of the book the Long Depression. I'm arguing in the book that there are differences between the normal booms and slumps we get in capitalism. The boom followed by the slump. Every eight to ten years in most capitalist economies, particularly in the post-war period, that is the experience. We don't last much longer than ten years before we have another crisis, recession, rising unemployment, people losing their jobs, companies going bust. Then we have the boom again. Uh, and it takes off. But occasionally, I'm arguing in this book, there are differences. Uh, where we don't just get the normal recovery, we remain in a depressed state, we being the capitalist economy on a global scale. So the book wants to distinguish between the normal process of booms and slumps called recessions by academic economists and depressions where the recovery is weak and doesn't return to the previous level. And these cycles of profit we have to analyze. The basis of the book is to argue that the reason for the recessions and depressions lies in what is happening with the profitability of capital in the capitalist mode of reduction. That's the key. Against other views expressed by Keynesians and others that it's to do with aggregate demand or it's to do with uh, banking deregulation and reckless greed, it's to look at the profitability of capital as the key to understanding what is going on in, in uh, capitalism. And that's based on, on a law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, which Marx developed 150 years ago, almost uh, to the month, uh, perhaps a little earlier, where he did, presented the argument that there is an inherent contradiction between the accumulation of capital to boost uh, productivity, to increase profit, and actually creating the conditions for a tendency for the profitability of capital to fall. And that law... Uh, has been debated over the last 150 years as being relevant to crises. In this book, I present a lot of evidence empirically to support the idea that that law is valid and is the best and most compelling explanation of crises under capitalism. And the other factor, particularly strong, is the development of what uh, Marx called fictitious capital. That is, the uh, spending by capitalists in speculating on stocks, shares, bonds, all sorts of financial assets which may or may not be relevant to what is going on in the economy in the productive sectors where real value is being created. There's a 
a huge expansion of credit way and beyond what is necessary uh, to expand the economy. And this speculative area has been one of the big features of the last 30 or 40 years, the expansion of speculative capital, fictitious capital, uh, what uh, many academics at the moment call the financialization process. And I want to argue that one of the big factors in the current situation is it's not only a question of capitalists trying to get rid of uh, capital which is no longer providing the return that they expected, but also a huge amount of debt that they've built up in the process of trying to compensate for a falling <coughs> profitability. And this book also, on the basis of, of uh, theory and empirical evidence, attempts to present predictions and forecasts. It's my view, and the book I express it in the, in the book, is that the job of scientific analysis is not simply to have a theory or a hypothesis. It's also necessary to test that theory to see if it's logical, but then to test it empirically to see if it's valid. And if it's invalid, you should go back and consider your original assumptions and logical arguments to change it. And one of the ways in which you test things is not just by looking at data and seeing if it fits the bill, but also making forecasts and predictions about what would happen. Weather forecasting used to be down to farmers guessing whether the, uh, the clouds are right or the birds were going in a certain direction. They had a certain level of scientific validity, but very weak. We have progressed on the question of weather forecasting in that you can get up in the morning and on your TV and you can get at least a three-day forecast, which is pretty reliable now as a result of the looking at theory, looking at the movement of, of uh, winds and climate, and also testing that empirically. It's also the job of social scientists to do that. As far as I'm concerned, it's not something that's completely separate. Finally, the book looks at not just the short-term uh, predictions that are going to happen over the, say, the next three or four years and so on, but all the longer-term uh, future of capitalism. Now, quickly, as time is short, um, I just want to remind you that the idea of depression doesn't come from me. It comes from a number of economists over the time who have looked at the issue of crises under capitalism and have concluded that it's sometimes these slumps are not normal ones. They don't return to the same level of, of trend growth, the same level of employment as before, or expand even further. They stay for a long time. Back in the 1930s, that was one of the big points that Keynes made about the 1930s, that the duration of the slump may well be prolonged, much more than people expect. Long, dragging conditions of semi-slump or subnormal prosperity, which may be expected to succeed the acute phase, namely that big drop like we had in the Great Recession of 2008-9. More recently, Anwar Shaikh, who's at the New School here, uh, uh, has presented a similar argument, which he says that the 2008 Great Recession was really a Great Depression, triggered by a financial crisis, but that was not its cause. <coughs> it was an absolutely normal recurrent paddle pattern of capitalist accumulation, but then it gave way to a long downturn which has not been resolved. Uh, Paul Krugman, the leading Keynesian, you can read in the New York Times every day, op ending about economic matters and mostly about political ones it seems at the moment, uh, Krugman says uh, back in 2012 that if we'll have to start calling this current situation a depression. And he actually wrote a book which he called End the Depression Now. He had an exclamation mark. I always thought that was a, a pretty uh, compelling effect. Now, um, if I look at, very quickly, this is a schematic model. I don't know if our YouTube viewers will see this, but they'll see that at the top level here, we have various trend growth in a schematic form. So you're growing along, and one sort of recession is just basically a V-shape, as in 1974-5. You go down, you come back, trend growth continues. In the 1982, a recession, you had a double dip. You went down, came back up again towards trend growth, that's the flat line, and then down again in a W shape, and then finally back to trend growth. Depression, in my schematic model, is like a square root sign. It comes down, it goes back up again, but it doesn't return to trend growth. And the evidence will show that. If we look at the bottom three graphs, what they're saying, this is the real position. I'm saying that I've identified, in my view, three periods in the history of capitalism in the last 150 years where we have a depression. In the 1870s to 1880s onwards, at various levels in different countries, we get a depression where the trend growth is not restored in any of these countries as it was at the end of the 1860s and early 1870s. 
And of course, the Great Depression is we see the, the crash in 1929, 1932, recovery to 1937, and back down again. Now, in neither of these examples is the trend growth restored, except in the case of the 1930s by a world war, which eventually restored a growth to, to, to new levels. And it, these, that, those lines, by the way, on the bottom line, are realistic. They're actually realistically measured to scale, to give you an indication. And finally, in the right-hand corner, is where I think we are now. We have the crash of 2008, the Great Recession, a recovery, goes up to 2012, uh, doesn't get back to the trend growth, and uh, has not got back to trend growth since the end of the Great Recession in the middle of 2009. Eight years later, we have not returned to the growth that we had uh, in, the, in the early 2000s. These are the losses of income achieved uh, by different countries uh, relative to what they would have had if they carried on growing from 2007 in the way they'd been going before. But then we had a great recession and a recovery. You can see that Greece has lost is 40% below where it would have been if it continued on trend. And just about every major country has suffered as a result of the Great Recession and the Great Depression. Now, I have a few prizes for today. I got them off the plane coming over here. So a few cheap uh, gifts I've got for you. One will be a Ferrero Rocher, which you'll really enjoy. Uh, this is to decide, and you have to tell me now, which major economy did not suffer any contraction of production at all during the Great Recession and went on roaming at a very high rate. Hand up at the back. China. China. Fair Rocher to that man. Now comes the really difficult one. This will be brandy or cognac. <laughs> Which OECD economy did not suffer, OECD economy did not suffer any contraction during the Great Recession. There's only one. Germany. Nope. Norway. Nope. Nope. Australia. Australia didn't. And one, which is the biggest uh, destination for Australian exports? Canada. China. China. <laughs> All those minerals go to China. So those are the, that, that is the point. I'm, uh, every other country suffered a contraction of at least two quarters in GDP in the OECD, and most of the emerging, big emerging economies suffered it, if not in the 2009, even in 2010. This was a global recession, a deep recession. Nothing has been so global as this one. And we can see the growth rate for the US has not really recovered. If you look at the red line at the bottom there on this graph, you can see growth after 28 quarters here has failed to get back to the same sort of rates of growth we've seen in previous recoveries. McKinsey uh, pointed out that 60 to 75% of households in 25 advanced economies market incomes were flat or below where they were in 2005. That's how much loss of income to households. Relative to where they were in 2005, 60 to 70 percent of households in 25 advanced economies are either where they were then or lower after, what is it, 12 years now. 81 percent of the US population were in groups with flat or falling market income since 2005. That's the impact that this recession has had. And if you look at the last bold line, it says, most likely, large numbers of people will indeed be poorer than their parents over the next decade as a result of that. And without a significant change, says McKinsey, a rabid Marxist economics text, uh, without significant change, the next 14 years are going to be, next 14 years, this is written in 2015, next 14 years are going to be painful for billions of people. Now, there's a graph. Well, dear to my heart, this is real wage growth in the UK over the past 166 years. If you look at the red bottom corner, you will see that real wage growth is actually negative, and it's been the slowest level of real wage growth in 166 years since the Great Recession ended in 2009. Never been as long period of slow growth. A little bit of growth, but mainly down. You can see the other figures. Under 166 years, that's how bad this depression is for the British average working class people. Now, what are the causes? The book goes into the causes. Amar Shark, I'll skip this quote, basically says, don't expect it to be some sort of random event. Do you remember 
what was his name? What was the name of that Fed Reserve chief who was in charge? The, the maestro. Greenspan, when he got into the Senate in 2010, he was asked about the crisis. He says, well, I don't know. <laughs> I thought things were going well. And then suddenly, they didn't. It was a random event, he said. It was a one in a billion chance that it, this would happen. So this is hardly a great economic discovery. The leading Nobel Prize winner for neoclassical economics, Eugene Farmer, was queried more or less at the same time. He said, what do you make of this? He said, well, I'm not a macroeconomist, so I don't care. <laughs> but, he said, nobody in economics, meaning his lot, nobody in economics knows why there are slumps and probably will never know why there are slumps. This was a Nobel Prize winner. We think there's a bit more to it. Than Marx said there's a bit more to this. Based on the labour theory of value, which was based on value based as a result of labour, which Marx said was self-evident, nothing is produced unless working people work with nature to produce something, and that creates value, nothing, no other. Machinery yet doesn't produce machinery to produce machinery to do everything without any labour. We still have to have labour, and the contribution that he revealed was that that process of production of labour is not exchanged on an equal basis, People work eight hours, but they don't get the, the return of that in terms of their wages. There is an extraction by the owners of capital, the people who employ people, and they take a proportion of that, uh, of that labor, that surplus labor, which Marx called surplus value. So we have a working day, workers get their wages, V, capitalists get their profit, S, multiplied by the number of labor hours in the whole world, and that tells you how much surplus value or profit there is in the world. Starting with that, three billion, by the way, three billion labor hours, approximately. So an annual output is, starts with money, capitalists start with money, they buy some machinery, means of production, we call it, factories, etc. They employ some workers, they make the workers work hours, level of hours at a certain level of productivity, and they gain a surplus of that. Marx said the rate of profit is simple, it's S over C plus V and you get more money. So money makes more money. Now, according to the financiers, they make more money by simply buying and selling. Suddenly they have more money. Or they have less money, depending on how it goes. But actually, the process in a capitalist production system is more, more money comes from the actual exploitation of labor. And here's the trick. There's the rate of profit theory. Here's the trick. If the rate of surplus value, the rate of exploitation, is faster, than the expansion of machinery relative to labor, which is C over V, then the rate of profit will rise. It will fall if the organic composition of capital or the increase in the amount of invested in machinery versus labor rises faster than the exploitation of labor achieved by that. Marx said that tends to be what happens most of the time. The organic composition of capital, C over V, will rise faster than the rate of surplus value. Sometimes that's not the case, the counter tendency will operate and the rate of profit will not fall. So it's not a straight line. But when we do get the big fall in profitability and the mass of profits, then we get the necessity of businesses going bust, workers being laid off, wages closed down. All that is in order to try and get profitability back up again and the mass of profit and the rate of profit and profitability resumes. So it's a cycle going, tendency forcing it down, then coming up again. It's a cyclical process of crisis. That's how we get these cycles is the argument. What is happening to the rate of profit? In my book I say, there you are, this is not my figures, these are the figures of Esteban Maito, hiding away in a university in Argentina. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to get him over to the States yet, but he's done a considerable amount of work on 14 different countries, amalgamated the national rates of profit, and this is what the global rate of profit looks like since the 1850s in some of the major economies of the world. It's not a straight line, but the tendency that Marx argued does exist and it's come down considerably. Although you can see from 1975, if I blow it up a little bit more, the secular decline stopped in the early 80s and it's consolidated in this neoliberal period with exploitation, crushing trade unions, privatization, all the other measures to drive up the rate of surplus value and keep profitability up. But not enough to stop the Great Recession eventually in 2007. 
Jose will tell us a little bit more about the relation between corporate profits, presumably, and the fixed investment, or maybe he won't, but he does in his books and his papers. And you can see there's a close correlation between the direction of profitability or profits and the direction of investment. Investment is key under capitalism to, ch to a capitalist uh, boom or slump. Now, if I look at the profitability, which the book does over the last 10 years, you can see uh, on the, uh, the change since the trough, which we've seen actually since the peak. If you look at the right-hand side of this chart, you can see that since the peak of profitability in 2007, the euro area's profitability is 13% below where it was. UK's is 4% below it was. Japan's is more or less flat or slightly below. And the booming American economy has increased its profitability since 2007 by 0.8. Um, and we can see what's happened to profitability and investment. Investment is the red line since December 2007 in the major economies. More or less flat, no real improvement, huge increase in the amount of debt, particularly corporate debt, since the crisis. I'll move on quickly now to the, to the issues of cycles. We've discussed cycles. I'm arguing in the book that we can go further than that. Marx and Engels looked at the question of cycles. They saw that capitalism went in booms and slumps in cycles. And he said, uh, Marx said to Engels, I want to try and... Uh, somebody was asking me earlier whether you should look at things empirically. Uh, and test them. Well, Marx and Engels are usually regarded as people who go on droning in great big books about stuff and never do anything to do with proper empirical analysis. That's not true. If you read volume one, you can see a lot of efforts to do that. Marx attempted even go further to use mathematical analysis to try and work out how the movement of uh, booms and slumps and cycles went on in capitalism. I argue in the book that we can look at longer than the profit cycles. We can look at what is called the Kondratia cycle, the K cycle, and we can merge these together and come up with a view about what direction, if the fall in production prices and the pressure globally is downward and profitability is downward, combining those two together with other cycles, you can make a forecast, either things are booming or they're doing the opposite. My argument, since uh, 1997 or the end of 2000 for the major economies, is that profit cycle is downwards, and the K cycle, the big longer cycle, which we can discuss if we have time, and I think uh, Jose will be, is also in a trough, leading to a period where we're actually near the bottom of a very bad depression, which is why we have a depression. If you look in the period 1929-46, that was a similar period, K cycle down, wind, the profitability down. We're in the winter period, as it's called by some. And this particular post-war expansion we've had since 2009, at least in the US, is now one of the longest ones. It's eight years long since the end of the Great Recession. We've raced along, the US has, at 2% a year, about uh, compared to 3.3%, which used to be the growth before the, the trend. The trend is much lower, but it's, we've had expansion, but it's very, very weak, and now it's getting long. It's coming towards its end of its eight to 10 year period. Profits are now beginning to fall back. You can see a bit of a tick towards the end here, but on the whole, the trend is pretty much flat for global corporate profits on all major economies, which would suggest we're getting towards the end again of this uh, particular expansion. US real business investment up to July 16, I haven't taken it up a bit further, is actually flat or negative. Business investment, not all the other sorts of investment, housing investment and so on, but business investment, which is crucial to capitalism, is doing nothing. So, in my view, we're heading back towards another recession, which is necessary in order to try and raise the profit profitability of capitalism in general. The book discusses this question in more detail. What are the challenges? The book ends on this. The challenges for capitalism looking further. Inequality. Never has inequality of wealth and income been so bad since probably the late 19th century or even earlier. Now, not only globally, well, also globally, but within each of the major economies, particularly the US and the UK, we've seen a massive rise in inequality. That is going to increase social pressures for the ruling elite to control that situation, and we're beginning to see that. The other big issue is productivity is very low. The capitalists are looking to introduce robots, artificial intelligence, to boost the productivity of labor. Will that lead to a new lease of life for capitalism, or does it create further tensions between profitability and productivity. The book argues that. And of course, perhaps the topic of the weekend is climate change. The rapacious drive for profit is destroying the planet. 
environmentally, increasing the pressure to global warming and climate change, and uh, there is no attempt by capitalist governments to really resolve this in any particular way, uh, tied as they are to the interests of the fossil fuel industry and elsewhere, as represented by the decision of our wonderful president. And as I see, the productivity figures are low, growth is low, inequality is rising for the richest 1% and this blue line shooting up. The top 1% of adult wealth holders in the world, in the world, own 51% of all global wealth. The top 1% of adults own 51% of all wealth. And the bottom half, the bottom 50% of the world's population, adults, have only 1% of all the wealth. The top 10%, which is a few of us in this room, you'd be surprised to know, certainly how poor the rest of the world is, own 89% of all the world's wealth. And we can see that in the US, a similar process of the top 0.1%. The red line now has more wealth than the bottom 90%. 0.1% of adults or households in the US have more wealth than the 90%, the bottom 90% of the population. That's how unequal we are. And same with in income inequality. The robots are coming. People are growing a little bit more, 7 billion to 9 billion by 2040 in the world. But the robots are expanding dramatically. But you'll be glad to hear you need about 10 robots per person to make it really work. So there's got to be a lot more robots before we get all replaced. This is the issue in the book. Who will rule? Left-hand side is what capitalism would like. The right-hand side is what we would like. And of course, the issue of global warming, which I've just mentioned. That is the basis of the book. Uh, I don't know how long I took, but I'm hoping I didn't use up too much of the time with two speakers who are now going to give that a good working over. Who needs to go first? You. Paul will start. I'm going to start. As usual, that is preliminary to stating some disagreements. But I want to stress that I really mean it. It's a good book. And if you hadn't, haven't read it yet, you should. After the agreements will come a few caveats, and more interestingly, some questions. And these will lead to some more general questions that I think will be worth discussing. To begin, the basic idea of the book, that we are in a long depression, like the long depression of the late 19th century and the Great Depression of the early 20th century, seems to me quite right, as far as one can see at present. Despite the fact that it is always tricky to opine about a subject as complex as the world economy, I think it is important to take the epistemic risk because the implications of this are worth thinking about. I'm going to skip a summary of the book because Michael has done it very well himself. He knows that book better than anyone, I suspect. The political implications of the state of affairs that he has outlined are worth noting. It spells the pointlessness of the standard social democratic, or one should rather say today, neo-social democratic <coughs> response to economic difficulties. Increasing government spending, supporting the revival of trade unionism, trying to organize electoral forces to work in such directions. The actual trend in the political system worldwide in response to these economic conditions is the opposite of this. Governments willing to impose austerity on their subject populations while concentrating public resources on the relief of corporate wants, policies widely camouflaged by nationalistic or even xenophobic rhetoric. The end, or at least abeyance of the economic growth that made possible the improvement of working and living conditions for the working class in the past, calls for a different politics, one willing to confront the inherent limits of capitalism as a social system. My problems with the book fall under two heads. First, the use of economic data in understanding the vicissitudes of capitalism and the identification of cyclical phenomena in the analysis of those data. To start with that second point, I was not convinced by Robert's enumeration of cycle types. He lists, as you just saw, a cycle of profitability, the business cycle, the Kuznet cycle, and the long wave Kondratiev cycle, identifying the current conjuncture like earlier major downturns 
as due to a negative coincidence of these four cycles. It has been clear since the 18th century that modern economic life is characterized by fluctuations in a variety of indices. But the identification of cycles, as Wesley Mitchell showed in his great book of 1927, Business Cycles, is an extremely difficult matter, dependent on a multitude of assumptions necessary to isolate essential movement from the mass of fluctuating data. Discussing the possible existence of long wave and Kuznet cycles alongside a shorter term set of fluctuations, Mitchell thought that it might be that the different lengths of the three sets of waves could well be due to, in his words, differences in methods of fitting trends and computing and <coughs> smoothing deviations. Though he thought it might also turn out that the various wave patterns discovered by different researchers are actually inherent characteristics of a capitalist economy. It seemed to him that this was not obviously true. My impression is that this remains the case 80 years later, and that earlier controversies over the reality and significance of the of waves and the Kuznet swerve are far from settled. However, for reasons that I will try to clarify before I conclude, I don't think it matters very much from a Marxian point of view. It is certainly clear that the history of capitalism is characterized by a very broad pattern in which periods of economic prosperity alternate with periods of depression. Even if there are large areas of disagreement by econo among um, economic historians about the timing of these periods, as well as about their detailed structure, it was this broad pattern that Marx wanted to explain as he believed it was an indicator of structural difficulties inherent in capitalism. As is well known, Marx found the root cause for this cyclical behavior in the movements of the rate of profit on industrial capital. It may be worth mentioning that this was also Wesley Mitchell's opinion. But after all, it is perfectly obvious that in a social system in which the activities of production, and therefore of consumption, are regulated by the success of capitalist investors in achieving a satisfactory return on their investments, economic well-being will depend on the adequate <coughs> profitability of private capital. Hence, the most important law of political economy, according to Marx, was the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall over the long term, which he explained as the result of a tendency towards the replacement of labor by machinery in production, in a system in which wealth represented control over the labor performed by productive workers. The place of this law in Marx's diagnosis of capitalism's future, as Michael said, is a topic of much disagreement among Marxists. But I will not discuss this here, because Robert seems to me correct to take this law of Marx's as central to the explanation of capital's current predicament. The questions I wish to raise, and here I come to the second problem I mentioned, concern the interpretation of Marx's theory in terms of the empirical phenomena of the capitalist economy. The standard approach to this question among economists seeking to evaluate Marx's hypothesis involves the utilization of business and government statistics, subject, of course, to various transformations in the interest of bringing them into line with Marx's concepts. Usually this last goal the Marxizing of statistics, is not achieved in a particularly convincing fashion. Marx defines the rate of profit as the surplus value produced by the world economy in relation to the value of labor power employed in production, together with the value of means of production and raw materials consumed in production. Roberts, however, like many Marxists, defines the rate of profit as the net national product, less wages relative to net fixed assets plus wages plus benefits, these are all price quantities, not value ones, a matter to which I will return. Oddly, Roberts chooses this simplest conception of the rate of profit as the best, despite his recognition that Marx's concept is framed in terms of the productive part of the economic system, what Marx called industrial capital, in contradistinction to commercial and financial capital, which appropriate surplus value under the headings of both profit or interest and wages produced in the productive sector. Even while momentarily recognizing it, in fact, Roberts proceeds by completely ignoring the extreme idealization with which Marx represents capital in his theory. Marx abstracts from the existence of nations and their governments, commercial and financial capital <coughs> and landed property, 
and the construction of the model in terms of which he defines the rate of profit and demonstrates its tendency to decline. That is, for those of you who are adepts, the material covered in capital volumes one, two, and three up through part three. His variables, Marx's variables, therefore, stand for quantities of values, not empirically given prices. Marx takes pain to argue in part two of volume three that the difference between commodity values and prices leaves the society-wide total central to his theory unchanged. But even here, the prices, the so-called prices, are those of the idealized model, not the prices that we encounter in the real world. Despite the fact that Marx's is the theory of world capitalism, most researchers concentrate their analytic energy on the United States because this is the only nation with reasonably accurate and complete business data. But even if reliable profitability statistics for the world economy existed, which they don't, they could not settle the question of the correctness of Marx's law of the tendential fall in the profit rate. What Marx calls profit in the discussion of his law is surplus value produced by industrial capital as measured against invested constant and variable capital. In the real world, however, this surplus value exists in such distinct forms as profit on all types of investment, interest, rent, property, income, and taxes. As Marx says in a draft of Capital, I quote, when speaking of the law of the falling rate of profit in the course of the development of capitalist production, we mean by profit the total sum of surplus value, which is seized in the first place by the industrial capitalist irrespective of how we may have to share this later with the money lending capitalist in the form of interest and the landlord in the form of rent. The rate of profit in this sense may fall, though, for instance, the industrial profit rises proportionately to interest or vice versa. I could give some examples of how this works in the real world, but let me continue with the abstract, the abstraction. Sure. For example, <laughs> the increase in, in the United States corporate profitability observable in business data for the late 1980s into the early 1990s was certainly in part due to progressively lower nominal and inflation adjusted interest rates. So interest went down, profits go up. That has nothing to do with what Marx calls the rate of profit, which is divided between interest and what capitalists call profit. Based on a reduction of the previous very high interest rates that followed the tightening of American monetary policy in the early 1980s, on the success of capital in tacking the U.S. working class, on the low cost of imports, and on Asian countries accumulating huge foreign exchange reserves, buying U.S. securities, and so reducing their yields, so that part of what drove the interest rates down was the accumulation of American government securities by Chinese and other invest government investors abroad. As an insurance against financial trouble after the crisis of 1997-1998, an increase in the profitability of American capital during this period tells us absolutely nothing determinate about what Marx called the rate of profit. But couldn't we, if the statistical material, which doesn't exist, were available, and if we had an agreed upon system for the interconversion of different currencies, which we don't really, couldn't we at least in principle, in theory, construct some empirical equivalent for surplus value at a given time by numerically reassembling the parts into which it is divided when split among the various fractions of the exploiting class? This is not possible, fundamentally because of the fact that value is represented in the real world only in the form of prices, quantities of money, which move independently of values. As Marx says, capitalist production is marked by a continuous change in value relations, if only because of the constant change in the productivity of labor that characterizes it, but also because of alterations in the distribution of capital among and within branches of social production, and as a result of changing economic relations between regions of the world, with distinct levels of investment and labor productivities. Although they can be expected to have long-run consequences for price relations, these changes need not be reflected in any short-run or direct way by price changes. Value relations are also rendered uncertain by the tendency of investment to expand beyond demand in prosperous times, 
and to shrink below social requirements in periods of depression. While value is defined in Marx's system in terms of a supply-demand equilibrium, again, a purely imaginary thing, which is only accidentally realized in the real world. As a result, it would be impossible to say, even if the statistics existed, how much of what we might count at any given moment in actual price terms as the value of total capital, variable capital, and surplus value is real, meaning by the word real, corresponding to the constructs of Marx's theory. Both new investment and ongoing operations are commonly financed by debt, debt that cannot be repaid if the economy fails to grow at the anticipated rate and that therefore represents only a hoped for quantity of value, not a really existing quantity of value. Value relations are further obscured by the fluorescence of financial instruments. In Marx's theoretical model, at least as far as he developed it in volume three of Capital, the revenue of money capital is a portion of the total surplus value generated by industrial capital. In reality, financial sector revenues involve more than a redistribution of the existing surplus value produced in the rest of the national economy, or even internationally. The prices of what Marx called fictitious capital, equities, bonds, and other more exotic financial products like derivatives and collateralized debt obligations, are determined by discounted future cash flows, hence by interest rates and the demand of purchasers for particular kinds of investment. As a result, to quote a one-time manufacturer of such products, the securities price does not have a direct relationship to the surplus value currently being exploited from the productive workforce. So that it is even possible that while the underlying conditions for capital accumulation might worsen, implying a lower rate of profit, the price of securities could still rise. These items circulate as things of value and can, for instance, be used as security for loans, further obscuring the actual values in play at any time. Finally, a related problem is posed by the, incredibly, the increasingly large role played by the state in economic affairs. Since national governments, at least in the so-called West, are not for the most part owners of investable capital, their economic activities, like their other activities, are financed out of the surplus value created in the private enterprise economy. As a result, the value of a government bond is doubly fictitious, as it only represents the net present value of future coupon and principal repayments based on the financing of these payments from future tax receipts. Products sold to governments, like weapons or steel for bridges, are exchanged for surplus value to be produced sometime later in the capitalist production process. What appear as profits for vendors to governments are in reality redistributed portions of the actual or anticipated total surplus value. In business statistics and national economic accounts, however, they appear as newly produced profits like any others. Does this mean that Marx's crisis theory lacks empirical content? Something I'm always accused of implying. One advantage of Marx's approach is precisely his recognition of the difficulty for theory posed by the impossibility of normal observational methods, in this case, statistical ones, for isolating basic aspects of such a complicated system of phenomena. He wrote in the preface to Capital, in the analysis of economic forms, neither microscopes nor chemical reagents are of assistance. The power of abstraction must replace both. But this is in order to delineate clearly what he continued the basic features of capital as an historically specific set of social relationships. Hence his theory gains initial plausibility from its systematic treatment of these observable features of the economy the centrality of commodity exchange, money, the social relation of wage labor and capital, and the characteristic dynamic of growth of productivity via mechanization. These are all features recognizable without a st significant statistical apparatus. And in Marx's own work, historical data, as he says, for the most part function to illustrate and not to test theoretical ideas. Marx's case is strengthened by the success with which his theory predicted long-term trends, the worldwide expansion of the system, its continued mechanization, its cycling between prosperous and depressive periods, the concentration and centralization of capital, 
and the expansions of unemployment and the tendency toward immiseration of the mass of the population that regularly accompany the long-term growth of the labor force. These trends are clearly recognizable despite the conceptual fuzziness <coughs> produced by the complex complexity of the system with its attendant ill-defined significance of quantitative data. Similarly, the Marxian theory explains the failure of the classical arc of capitalist development to be generalized across the world, as various theories of economic growth expected it would be, as declining profitability has come to hinder global accumulation. With respect to historically more limited phenomena, to take two examples, <coughs> Marx's theory explains the failure of the 1844 English Bank Act and, on a larger scale, allowed the prediction of the failure of Keynesian interventions to end the business cycle, certainly one of the very few successes in large-scale prediction by any social <coughs> science. As I observed earlier, and it is this that forms the basis of all the attempts to prove or disprove Marx's law of motion by statistical means, the phases through which the capitalist economy cycles are dominated by changes in the rate of profit in the ordinary sense the return to capital investment collected by capitalists over time. This allows us to pose the question of the utility of Marx's theory at a less general level for the understanding of particular phases or even episodes of economic history. Specifically, the question of the relation of empirical profitability to the unobservable theoretical systemic rate of profit. In application to real world situations, Marx's theoretical model, like models in other sciences, physics, is, uh, but biology also provide many, many examples, provide a pattern of explanation that can be instantiated by historically specific constellations of economic phenomena in which the value relations fundamental to Marx's law of motion, in particular, the relation of surplus labor performed to the labor necessary to reproduce capital investment, can be identified conceptually, though not in terms of quantitative data. Thus, Marx's law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall does not directly refer to what is conventionally called the rate of profit in business statistics. It refers, as we have seen, to the relation between global capital investment and the quantity of surplus value produced by it, and available at any given moment for a multitude of ruling class projects, which at the present time include such unprofitable uses as organized killing through war and limiting deaths from starvation and natural disaster through supportive relief agencies. But since the mass of surplus value available constitutes an absolute limit to its appropriation by individual capitalists as profit, the tendency to the decline of this unobservable rate is clearly related, given the centrality of business profits to this society, to a tendency for conventional profitability to decline, even though this tendency may be offset at a given time by, for example, decreasing the amount of surplus value taken by the state. A declining rate of profit, in the Marxian sense, may manifest itself in a perceivable conflict between conventional profitability and the use of tax revenues for various government purposes. The theoretical distance between Marx's abstract value analysis and the range of historical phenomena forbidding an immediate identification of the two not only sets a limit, to the explanatory and so predictive power of Marxian theory, but constitutes a strength. The very distance between theory and phenomena opens a way to understanding changes in the nature of crisis phenomena. This requires some way of bridging the categories, framing the Marxian idealization and the categories of everyday life. To take a crucial example, how are the familiar phenomena of the business cycle, crises, depressions, recoveries, and prosperities, to be associated with the elements of Marx's conceptualization of the cycle? Writing before the development of business cycle theories and the systematic collection of data, Marx found his subject matter in the empirical experience of crises as breakdowns in the process of social reproduction. On the one hand, he said, there is a superabundance of all kinds of unsold commodities in the market. On the other, bankrupt capitalists and destitute starving workers. Typical phenomena then as now included bank panics, credit contractions, halts of production in the face of contracting markets, attendant mass unemployment and contractions of international trade. 
while in particular crises affecting only one segment of an economy or one geographical area, the eruptions were only sporadical, isolated, and one-sided, and what Marx called world market crises, all the contradictions of bourgeois production erupt collectively. The very attempt to control the effects of capitalism's inherent crisis tendency has brought changes in the way in which that tendency manifests itself. Bourgeois economic theory has not successfully theorized these changes, hence the embarrassment of Mr. Greenspan, Mr. Lucas, and others. But the fact of recurrent economic crisis is apparent, even through the fog of bourgeois theory and the data it structures. Beyond this, the analysis of crisis and the changes in its mode of manifestation over time requires what Marx called the power of abstraction. If we start from Marx's idealized model of capitalism, it is possible not only to explain the alternation of depression and prosperity, but also to distinguish capitalist prosperity proper, so to speak, from a condition of growth produced in part by non-productive economic activity. Since the government, apart from whatever productive resources it controls, has at its disposal only quantities of surplus value taxed or borrowed, from its original capitalist appropriators, the profits earned by particular enterprises paid out of public spending represent the reallocation of surplus value already produced by the system as a whole. So the valorization of capital in these cases is illusory. During World War II, for instance, the American government purchased roughly, roughly half, World War II, roughly half the national product. Under these conditions, the rate of investment was 2.9% of gro GDP, gross national product, as it was then called, a rate below that of the Depression years, with the sole exception of 1932, when it was 1.5%. From a Marxian point of view, the Great Depression can only be said to have ended by the late 1940s, mm. when private capital accumulation revived in the US and abroad. So capitalist prosperity is not high employment or production of lots of stuff. Capitalist Prosperity is the production of sufficient surplus value to enable an accelerated accumulation of capital. So even the identification of what counts as a prosperity or what counts as a crisis depends on your theoretical point of view and is not something that can be deduced by, from the numbers. To come back to Roberts's book, take, well, from the conventional point of view, the growing burden of debt, public and private, since the Second World War, is a problem to be mastered. In Marxian terms, it constitutes a new manifestation of insufficient profitability. Looked at from the other side, it is the refusal of capitalist governments to allow any post-war recession to run its course as a full-fledged depression that has prevented the restoration of the conditions for a full bore prosperity. And I would say this is really true from the later 1950s on. Since the economy remains a mixed economy, combining a larger privately owned sector with a growing but still smaller state financed sector, the stagnating capitalist economy continues to experience the ups and downs of the business cycle, though in a dampened form. Even so, the continuing low level of accumulation due to low profitability produces a susceptibility to moments of severe disruption, such as that experienced in 2008. It is the great virtue of Roberts's book to make this situation clear. So, thank you. Okay, well, Jose will now present a entirely different way of looking at it. <laughs> Back to chance. Okay, so um, let me start by saying my global evaluation of the book by Michael Roberts. I summarize it in these four uh, points. I believe it's an important contribution to social knowledge, particularly to the analysis of economic crisis in capitalism. Second, I believe it's a large compendium of valuable information on the Great Recession of the late 20th, uh, of, well, the past 
and the following period of his sluggish economic growth that Michael Roberts calls the Long Depression. Third, I believe it's a major contribution to criticism of mainstream economics in all their varieties, uh, New Keynesians, Post Keynesians, Austrians, Neoclassicals, whatever you want. And uh, fourth, and not uh, the last but not the least, a significant contribution to the critique of capitalism. Okay, so uh, I would say that I agree with uh, something like between 90 and 95 percent of the book. Now I am going to focus in, uh, in the rest 10 or 5 percent that I disagree. So, uh, Michael defines depression as a period in which a crisis is followed by a partial recovery of capital accumulation so that the long-term trend of economic growth is not re uh, recovered. So while a regular crisis or recession would have this V shape, uh, the depression in terms of rovers would be this uh, square root shape or W shape with several recessions or crises uh, occurring very close one to another and generated a long period in which the economy is kind of in crisis or in, in, in a slump. Okay, so he defends this kind of typology by mentioning only three depressions. He talks about a depression in the late 19th century, another depression in the 1930s, and another depression that started in 2008 and would be still going on. Now, I kind of, uh, I am kind of an empirical person, and three cases of something is not good for theorized very much. Uh, uh, now, more solid data uh, and a more solid idea that uh, Roberts repeatedly suggests in his book is that sometimes in an economic crisis, uh, the rate of profit uh, fails to recover. And for a while, the rate of profit is still at low levels, which, of course, uh, generates a situation in which uh, uh, capital accumulation is uh, slow, and that uh, could be conceptualized as a period of depression. That idea is, for me, more solid than uh, just talking about these three periods that, uh, uh, by the way, are often considered by <coughs> Marxist economists as the only adding something in the 1970s or 80s, the only crisis that have been in the story of capitalism in the past 100 years. But I will go to this. Uh, well, this is um, what I want to mention now. Uh, in, in, in Critical uh, economics, uh, so uh, people connected with post-Keynesian or Marxist points of view in economics, often also with Urpi that organized this panel, is common to think that uh, economic crises are long periods of uh, several years, even many years, maybe 10, 20 years in which the economy is, uh, is depressed. So they often talk about this crisis at the end of the 19th century, then the 1930s or even the 1930s to the end of World War II, as Paul says. Then uh, there would have been another crisis in the 1970s, 1980s, this usually more fussily uh, 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 delimited. And then the most recent uh, crisis in the uh, starting in 2008. Where well, I disagree with that view, and I believe it's quite at odds with the ideas of Marx. Marx said that crises are quite uh, uh, short events, uh, short periods in which there is a, a kind of uh, quick removal of uh, the elements that are blocking the accumulation of capital, so that the system itself removes out what is in the middle, and that allows for uh, a new period of capital accumulation. In my view, that is quite at odds with some views that put 
crisis lasting 20, 30, or sometimes even 70 years, or, or well, there are historians like Wallerstein that say that the capitalists had been in crisis uh, during one century or two centuries or something like that. I disagree with that view. I disagree with the view that, uh, for instance, as Anwar Sheikh said, uh, there was a crisis in the 1980s or 1970s, 1980s, and then there was a long period of uh, prosperity, economic growth, and capital accumulation that only ended in 2008. Well, that is completely at odds with the fact that even at the world level, and even in terms of the world monetary, uh, the International Monetary Fund is recognized that there was what they call a global recession in 1982, another one in 1991, uh, another one in 2001, and so on and so forth. So, uh, crisis, in my view, are things that last uh, usually one year, maybe less, uh, sometimes a little bit more, two years, maybe sometimes three years, but not periods of 10, 20, 50 years. Okay, so. Uh, another particular criticism uh, of mine, and I believe in this, I quite coincide with Paul, is that uh, uh, Michael uh, observes uh, some regularities in the data that I believe don't exist. So he talks about all these cycles, cycles within, within cycles, the Kuznet cycle, the conductive, uh, the uh, the kitchen. Well, I believe these uh, are things that uh, are very. Uh, there is no evidence for for that. Uh, the the clear regularity in capitalism is that there are periods of uh, a strong capital accumulation intermingled with uh, periods of crisis. That is a regularity, but is not a cyclical regularity. And I believe. Uh, both Marx and Engels were wrong uh, by trying to look in regularity about that phenomenon. That, uh, that can, uh, the crisis in capitalism can be separated by short, very short period of only two or three years, or sometimes by more, much longer period, like 10, 12 years. And I believe the definition of uh, Wesley Mitchell of the business cycle which is as fuzzy as that, is, is a cycle, in quotation marks, that uh, separates uh, economic phenomenon uh, in, in periods of as short as two or three years, or as long as 10 or 12 years. Okay, so uh, I, I, I don't think there is any evidence in favor of the existence of the uh, conductive cycle, and indeed, if that cycle existed, which I dubbed, uh, we couldn't say it exists because there is no data. I mean, this is like, uh, have you heard about the Russell teapot? Uh, Russell said, well, I propose that there is a teapot uh, flying in the space between Venus and Mars. Well, nobody can tell that that is not true because it's impossible to decide if that teapot is there or not. Well, with, with, uh, if you propose a cycle which is 50 or 60 years long, and it happens that we have uh, data as very good for 150, 200 years of capitalism, it's very difficult to, uh, to say that that, uh, that uh, exists. I have made the joke of calling this Harmonia Mundi Economics. This is, is a, a figure in, in, in the book in which he puts all these cycles, one including another one, and one, well, it's, a, it's like, uh, you know, in music, the harmonics, uh, you have the main, and then the vibration of the, of the thing produces other sounds, and all fit perfectly. Well, it is not like that in, in, in the real world, and uh, less of, of all in economics. Pretty so, uh, okay, so, uh, as I already said, uh, for me, the basic characterization of economic phenomena is that they are irregular. Now, this is very clear when you look 
uh, in a statistical terms. Now, uh, let's uh, uh, compute the duration of the business cycle considering only the data for the United States between 1960 and 2009. Well, you have only nine, uh, eight elements to compute that. Of course, that gives you a lot of uncertainty of what is the average duration of the business cycle. And if you want to, comp to compute a 95% confidence interval of how long is that, uh, that cycle, is, uh, you see the, 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 the confidence interval goes from 3.8 years to 9 years. Is, there is a wide margin there. Now, if you put more, more uh, elements in the, in the computation and you include all business cycles between 1873 and 2009, you have now 29 data and it goes, the, the confidence interval gets narrower and now is from 3.9 to 5.6 years. So, every, anyway, what this tells you is that this is a very irregular phenomenon, okay? Now, let's go to the Kondratiev waves that are loved by, uh, by a lot of uh, colleagues. Uh, well, you have only, uh, if you consider data from the late 19th uh, century, you have only three, three data to compute. And look, the, the confidence interval you have for the duration of these supposed cycles is from 14 years to 75 years. It's a quite wide, uh, it's a quite wide confidence interval. Uh, if you look more concretely to the chronology as proposed, for instance, by, by Michael, uh, well, this is not properly his chronology because he doesn't refer to the so-called uh, 1970s, 1980s recession, but anyway. Uh, in this case, you would have first a wave of 56 years, then another one of 46, then another one of 32. Okay, so another way to show how Michael Roberts uh, <coughs> shows regularities in the data that I don't see. Well, this is uh, what he, I believe he calls the uh, stock market cycle. We have here a period of 60 is not 69, but 660, that's a typo. 60 years between 1950 and 2010, more or less, uh, is clearly neatly divided in four similar periods of bull market or, or, a, or a stock market. So each one is about 15 years each. Now, I, I look at this and I move slightly the limits because, of course, the first limit could be a little bit before. And then in, in, the, in, in 2008, 2008, the line start going up, so we could put there another bull market. So now we have five cycles and completely different in, in length. So anyway, uh, now another uh, concrete criticism is that in the book, he talks about this depression in the late 19th centuries. I believe he, he uh, put their interesting information, but in my view, there are some data there that are kind of internally inconsistent. For instance, these are uh, numbers that he, got, he gives in the book about GDP growth in the period 1850-1870 and in the period 1870-1890. Well, to be, for these numbers to be consistent with the depression, as he says, in the late 19th century, the numbers in 1870, 1890 should be much lower than the numbers in the previous 20 years. But you look at there and you see that uh, that is only true for the case of France. Apparently, neither in, the, uh, in Germany nor in the UK, in the UK uh, uh, was any kind of long depression. And apparently, He's talking about uh, something in the in the capitalism in the capitalist uh, wall at large. So um, uh, I have some uh, some uh, concerns about the way Michael computes uh, profit rates for national economies. I believe. Uh, uh, 
more information should be given about uh, about the sources and the data. I believe for for different countries the quality of the data are very different. I disagree with the view of Paul that you cannot compute any any profit rate that uh, that is meaningful at all, even if even if the profit rates that Michael is computing are not exactly the same as uh, derived from uh, the ideas of Marx, uh, maybe what we are looking at is as, as kind of something through a glass that is, uh, is deforming what we see, but still we can notice that there is a figure there with four legs and that is rather a mammal and not a, a flowing saucer. So anyway, um, <laughs> I, I believe these data are, are useful because indeed uh, capitalists use this data, uh, for instance, to move their capital. And that is, in my view, quite consistent with the views of Marx that often in capital says that uh, the, the pool for accumulation is the, is the profit rate. And the higher is the profit rate, the higher is the uh, incentive for capitalists to invest. And of course, if you cannot have any idea of what that profit rate is, well, then uh, they are kind of flying in a plane without any compass or without any tools for moving their capitals uh, between uh, Taiwan and, and Philippines or whatever. So finally, uh, two things and I end. Uh, one concrete thing has to do with uh, a detail uh, that uh, Michael provides about Spain during the period of General Franco. Uh, he says that it was a kind of failure of capitalism. Well, uh, it happens that according to his own views, uh, during the 1950s and 1960s, the profit rates uh, in Spain were between 10 and 15 percent, which is quite solid profit rate and the rate of growth of the Spanish economy was more or less in the same range between 10 and 15 percent, which is a kind of amazing economic growth for, for figures at the present. And by the way, it was the period in which Franco consolidated his uh, political power in the U.S. because, because uh, well, uh, that these periods of economic growth usually uh, usually are consistent with uh, a stability of politics, of people having access to some commodities and so on and so forth. And finally, what about uh, the long depression right now? Uh, well, I believe, uh, to tell the truth, uh, it is difficult to continue maintaining that we are still in a crisis. Uh, it is true that, uh, that growth in the past uh, few years has not been very good, but look at this data from European countries. Uh, more or less in 2013, unemployment is going down everywhere. Uh, of course, it's very high still in a number of countries, but the important thing is not that it's high or low. The important thing is if unemployment is growing or decreasing, in my view. Capital accumulation requires uh, more labor, and that is connected in uh, economic statistics with decreasing unemployment. I believe there is capital accumulation presently in, the, in, in Europe, as there is in other countries, including the US, of course. But of course, I agree with uh, Michael Roberts that very likely there will be another slump but there will be another slam, not the continuation of a crisis that supposedly started in 2008 and we are still in it. And that's all, thank you very much. Well, Mike, it's 11.20. No doubt no, people will ask questions and um, after we've done all the questions, then if you want to stay, I'll carry on for about two hours after that. Um, no. Um, yeah, the first gentleman there and then could uh, you prognosticate, please? You haven't gotten that far. I didn't. I will try. I give, I give myself five minutes and I'll prognosticate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. One thing that in this in this discussion, and I, I enjoyed your your book very much, uh, Michael, uh, uh, as well. One thing that I found kind of missing in this discussion, and I'm not a professional economist, but but uh, the whole um, 
monthly review uh, school uh, was kind of absent from your book and, and also not, there's a little bit of reference to it in the, in the, in the, in the discussion and also uh, Michael Hudson's uh, uh, take on, on this subject with, with uh, financialization. But I, I'd like to get, get the panel's uh, take a little bit on, on monopolization, financialization, uh, uh, over accumulation, under consumption, how that relates to uh, or contrasts with the Keynes view and, and how, how uh, uh, you gentlemen would, would, uh, would uh, understand those, that, those perspectives. That's definitely true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have a whole bunch of questions and observations and comments, so I'm going to... Um, one of them is, you know, why would anybody expect growth to continue as high as it was? I mean, like when somebody's starting up a society, you have to build the first, like say, you know, when capitalists first came to the U.S., you have to build all the houses, start up the factories. So growth, one year compared to the previous year, is going to be really high. When it gets to now, you know, and you know, and there are a lot of other factors, like I'm another monthly review person and, you know, and, and believe in kind of this thing of more, of that inequality is like a really big part of it. But anyway, it's more of like a maintenance thing once you have a mature, developed economy. So why would anybody expect growth to continue at any kind of high rate? And another thing, um, what interests me about, you know, you and some other people mentioned including real world observations in it and usually that's done with statistics and sometimes it's done with what actually happens. What fascinated me and what I liked a lot about Monopoly Capital when I first read it was it had so many quotes from the Wall Street Journal and from government people about their view of what was happening and their overall <coughs> take on it and um, to me that's that says a lot about why capitalists are doing what they're doing and I would like to hear more of that now and you know, today if possible or just in general I would like to hear more of it. And, and I guess one example of the kind, of, I, I did my senior thesis on this in 1972 to kind of convince myself whether monopoly capital made any sense, but I spent the whole year reading Fortune and Business Week and looking for articles where people were kind of theorizing, where mainstream capitalists were theorizing. And I guess I just want to mention one example that I bring up a lot of these things. The Wall Street Journal series called A Wash in Cash that happened, it, it was written in the early 2000, I can't remember the year, it might have been as late as 2005, but it was definitely before the, the crash of 2008, but I think there was a lot that predicted it about people just, there was all this money lying around that they didn't have anything real to invest in, so what they were doing was this fictitious capital and, and speculating. So I would like, what I find convincing about what's going on is hearing more of what, what, what they say is happening, especially if what they say is corresponding to what they're actually doing in terms of their own investment practices. I guess that's enough for now. Any other guys before I ask the panelists to let it go? I, I just would love to hear uh, your reaction to uh, Paul Maddox's um, yeah. discussion of uh, Marx's quote on the power of abstraction and the limits of empiricism and I mean that opens the door to the whole you know, Hegelian heritage of Marx and God help us dialectics. You know, um, I'm gonna have a go. With this about, uh, give myself thirty seconds to answer. Hold on, Paul's position. Uh, anybody else? Yep. Yes, yeah, so Orman Fisher, the debt deflation theory. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is anybody ever yeah. consider this? I don't read it. When was that? Oh, okay. It's been you guys want to have a go? Anything you want to say before I launch off? Well, I'd like to say one thing, which, which has to do with the interesting question of why would, why would you expect that a system would just keep growing? Uh, and in fact, this, it's a peculiarity, the idea of growth as natural, it's a peculiarity of capitalism. You don't find it in earlier cultures. So the first thing to notice is that this is a very bizarre feature of our culture. 
a very dangerous one as it turns out because we have already reached the point i mean in fact so called growth affects a very small portion of the world but we've already reached the point where growth as it is currently defined actually can't continue without con destroying the environment which is necessary for human life to continue so i mean that's the point that's already been reached <laughs> it's not it's yeah. not some time in the future so w the first thing to understand is that the I it isn't that you know oh where did this idea the you could it, it's a good question where did this idea come from so the first answer is it's a capitalist idea it doesn't come from any it, other cultures don't have it uh, you know individual roman gentlemen might have wanted to own more land but the abstract idea of growth, it was not a goal. Or the Roman Empire, in fact, had to grow. But it had to grow because in, it, it had to, it, in order to maintain itself, this was a culture based on slavery and on agriculture, and it needed, to, it needed more slaves, and it needed to maintain control over a large area of land, and that required a, a, a huge army. And the army required that after 20 years, its soldiers had land in which they could go and become farmers. So geographical growth was built into the way in which the Roman economy was set up, and that <coughs> led to its demise at a certain point. Uh, but there was not, but that's, geographical expansion was not what we mean by economic <coughs> growth. So the first place, what is economic growth? It, 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 it doesn't even primarily mean the production of more and more stuff, although that is the form in which, which growth takes. What it means is the accumulation of capital. So you have to ask why, why it, what is capitalism? Capitalism is a society in which one group of people the social power of a one group of people is defined by their control over the working activity of, of other people. And that means to, the more you, of other people's working activity you control, the more powerful you are. And the ruling class in this society is competitively constituted. It's not a unified, it's not a unified body which gets together and decides how to divide up the spoils. So that means that there is built into the way in which the system was constructed from its beginnings in late feudalism and early, early modern society until the present. Perhaps they would find a way of changing it in the future. At one time it was thought that the state capitalism of the Soviet Union would provide a model for the solution of this competitive problem among capitalists, but it turned out no, that didn't work. That was only a temporary stage in the development of a competitive capitalist system in Russia and China as, as well as in the so-called West. So the growth is growth, which means the, the accumulation of capital by individual corporate entities is a fundamental, is, is the fundamental activity, social activity of this particular form of society. And that's why it's limitation or its failure to happen is a problem because that's what capitalism is all about is the growth of control over social labor by individual corporate entities that's what capitalism is and if that doesn't happen if it doesn't expand then this is the system the system will be forced to come to an end so uh, it seems to me you know it's a, for example this is why I'm not so excited by the issues like employment growth, because employment growth is mostly in non-productive activities. So employment growth has, it has, has, has need have very little to do with uh, the uh, increase in capital accumulation. Growth in capitalism just means the accumulation of industrial capital, not the accumulation of money, debt, or claims on future income, or even the piling up of large quantities of stuff. So hence the dynamic and hence the problem of its limitation. I would say that was my main. Kevin, are you going to take a play for uh, I, I can refer to somebody is asking about the, uh, the monthly review uh, yeah. views. Uh, I, am, I, I am quite afraid that the three persons sitting here, <laughs> we are neither of us very, very enthusiastic about that the school of thought. Uh, in my particular view, I, be, I believe it represents a, a, an attempt to put together uh, the views of Marx and the views of uh, Keynes. 
and these are views that are quite at odds. So uh, it, this is like trying to mix uh, oil and water. Yeah, you remove it and yeah, it's there, but the 10 minutes later they are separated each other. These are quite different views about about society, about the economy, and uh, I, I, I believe that unfortunately these have permeated a lot of uh, economic uh, thought in, in the left, uh, <coughs> creating a very kind of soft criticism of mainstream economics, which lacks uh, internal consistency and, and doesn't hold water uh, in, in many aspects. Uh, particularly, uh, Zuezi is, is, is uh, very adamant in his idea of a persistent tendency of a capitalist to, is to be in a stagnation conditions, which I believe is uh, completely at odds with uh, what has happened in the past, uh, in the past 70 years. And well, that's my view. Well, I, I just want to, um, first of all, make some answers to the questions that people have raised. Uh, the one thing that probably the panel here does agree on is the centrality of Marx's law of the tendency rate of profit to fall as an explanation and the basis of understanding crises under capitalism. And that is where the monthly review, monopoly capital, and many other uh, views within the Marxist area or heterodox area disagree. I would say the view expressed by the panel uh, that the Marxist law of the tendency rate of profit to fall is the basis and foundation of an understanding of crises under capital, the view of the panel is a minority view amongst uh, Marxists. Not just amongst heterodox, as we like to call them economists, which is this mishmash of people who are post-Keynesians and others and Marxists, but most Marxists don't agree, may think it's either a lack of demand under consumption in some form or disproportion between the growth of production and the growth of the consumer goods sector or anarchy of production, all sorts of other combinations of this. The one thing that most Marxists would disagree with is the centrality of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall as a basis for a theory of crises. So from that point of view, my book and also the, the views expressed by Paul and Jose in their works and a few others it has been a minority view. It's, I think it's growing in uh, popularity, I'm glad to say, uh, because I think it has a bit more compelling uh, explanation for us. So that the views of the monthly review and Monopoly Capital and Paul Sweezy and the foundations there, Paul Baran and so on, is specifically actually to reject that theory and look for an alternative, alternative one. It's not been, it, that's a product of history which we haven't got time to go into because I think, don't think all the leading uh, socialist leaders of revolutionary movements ever adopted that theory, understood that as the basis of crisis theory. You read the history of crisis, Richard Day's book is a good explanation to show how all the great leaders of the internationals, uh, theoretical leaders I'm talking about, didn't ever, never adopted that as a theory of crisis. It's, we have learned more. We've understood what Marx is trying to say better now, and we've applied it and tried to provide an explanation for it. Now, others have raised point, well, I'd like to know what the capitalists are doing. You know, let's quote what the capitalists do. Well, and somebody else said, um, what about the issue of the huge amount of corporate profits, of wash with cash corporations are uh, at the moment? How can we talk about declining profitability in this environment? All these points are in my book. All of them are dealt with. Loads of quotes. You want quotes? I gave you a couple. There's a hundred quotes in the book, boringly so, about what uh, capitalists and the leaders of capitalism and the theoreticians of capitalism are saying about the crisis and why they didn't understand and so on. There's a whole section on a wash with capital, and that whether that really means that rising profits means there isn't a falling profitability. I deal with that issue, and uh, it, to some extent, and if you go on my blog, you'll get an internal amount of stuff <laughs> on, on that, which will uh, sicken the rest of you who don't like a lot of stats. And this is a continual argument. I make a little joke, but it is a continual argument. Uh, there are a number of Marxist economists who would put forward this position and say that the position of Marx's law of profitability falling is refuted by the fact that uh, Apple has you know, a trillion dollars sitting around the world and this proves that uh, Marx's law is wrong because there's loads of cash going and yet there's not much investment going on. So how is profitability can't be related to investment and growth? It must be separated. I just wanted to clarify, that wasn't what I meant. Uh, I didn't, wasn't questioning that, that it's bad situation just because there is so much money. Yeah. I was, what I was bringing, the point I was making was that 
they don't see possibilities of investing in real stuff. No, 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 I, I understand that. that. And I think that is the explanation for it. That we, the, the, and, but more than that, we can't go into it in detail, but a wash with cash is a very small minority of most corporations. Most corporations or capitalist enterprises, to be more exact, are not awash with cash. Uh, we're talking about, if you take the stock market thing, but Jose, Jose was showing earlier, I just saw a figure the other day that showed you we've seen a massive increase in the stock market. But if you take the top 10 companies out of the American stock market index, then the stock market hasn't risen particularly much over the last seven or eight years. I think 26% compared to if you, uh, if you take out the top 10, the Apples and the Microsofts and all those boys who have made huge uh, things. So you have to be more careful about how we analyze that material. But again, these are other aspects to discuss. The most important thing, I suppose, is to deal with some of the, the more deep criticisms that uh, the panelists have made against the book. And I think the key point here, is, first of all, is Paul's view that uh, Collecting all these stats, trying to analyze, get up with a rate of profit for uh, the world, for the US, for Spain, for France, for Italy. Roberts goes on across the world, sticking rates of profit in everywhere. Uh, this is all very much interesting, but probably pointless and a waste of time for two reasons. First of all, the stats aren't any good. They're all official stats. Paul argues because they're in prices and they don't really reflect accurately value and therefore surplus value and the Marxist categories to explain that. Secondly, they're not global, uh, so we don't have, uh, if we're looking at a national rate of profit, we don't really know what's going on globally because, you know, capitalists are hiding it in tax havens and, and Switzerland and so on, so the rates of profit nationally don't actually reflect what the rate of profit is. And worse than that, Roberts actually adopts a rate of profit which has anything to do with productive capital, which he should do if he's looking at the Marxist rate of profit. Well, uh, uh, and here, um, Paul goes on to say that the most useful thing about data anyway is just to illustrate the key points of Marxist theory. So the most important thing is we have prosperity and we have depression, we have centralization, we have immiseration, we have unemployment. We can look at general things and trends and we know that capitalism is, doesn't work and goes into periods of downswing or upswing. That's all we really need to do. We don't need to go and test actual rates of profit and see whether they're going up or down because A, that's impossible, and B, it's not necessary in order to justify capitalism. Well, I don't think I agree. I don't agree with that. I think it's the job of any scientific analysis, and I don't exclude Marxism from scientific analysis, contrary to some Marxists. Uh, it's not a metaphysical operation. It's a scientific analysis of what's going on in the world using, I think, categories and theories which best explain and can expose the nature of capitalism to us than any other way, and that we should test those categories as best we can, using the statistics as available as best we can. The fact that things are in prices and could be inflated isn't, is a problem, but it can be, we can try to overcome that problem. Prices overall, and particularly over a trend, will reflect the underlying forces of the value movements of the Marxist categories in the global economy and in national economies. And indeed, if we look at all the measurements attempted on the rate of profit, not just by me, but loads of other scholars on this issue, there's one thing that's striking about them all, that the trends are basically the same. There are maybe different turning points in different <coughs> countries, but overall, for example, the MITO graph I showed you earlier of 14 countries, there is not just the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, not in a straight line, but it actually falls. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a robust fake figure because other people have attempted different ways of me measuring it and still come up with more or less the same trends and things. We can debate different points about it, but I think that's one of the key results of the work we've done. And it doesn't matter that we're working in prices. Prices, after all, is what capitalism is about. As Marx explained, is prices of reduction and modification of the values. Yes, market prices and financial stock market prices are can often be well out of line of prices of production and values, but they're all soon dragged back into line over a period of time through the process of the of a crisis that capitalism develops. So I, I don't think it's an, a, it's an impossible or a wasteful task to apply, uh, to attempt to analyze empirical concept. Now we can argue about a lot of the, the data points. Jose has made the point 
that why well, I go into flights of fancy when I get to cycles, uh, because there's only three data points for a depression. I haven't got time to argue about why I could justify each of those three areas as being depressions. I, I presented you a schematic argument that we don't, we have lower trend growth. He showed that different, the trend growth was different, for, wasn't actually lower in some countries. It depends on which period you take, as always with these questions. And in fact, the, the late 19th century depression was not a simultaneous global one. Some parts were in depression when others weren't. It was different in the Great Depression. It's quite clear. I can't see any evidence to suggest that the Great Depression of the 1930s wasn't a Great Depression in the way that I've defined it. And it was different from other movements and uh, of booms and slumps that we'd had in, period, uh, in other periods. And I argue that the case to now. I agree with Jose that the position that some people advocate that capitalism is in some sort of permanent crisis of pr depression over 50, 60, 100 years is ridiculous. That is not the way that the process has been analyzed by Marx, and, and the evidence doesn't show that. But all I'm saying in this book, that there are specific occasions when it is a bit different, where we do have a depression -y period that's different from the usual booms and slumps. And I try to present some arguments about why that is the case. And what it means is the profitability at the moment is still too low. And to reach the question of prognostication, if, productivity, if pro profitability in the major economies is still too low, and that is why if low investment is down there, then ba basically the cleansing effect of a slump has still not succeeded and created a new environment for capitalism to expand and to start a process of a higher rate of accumulation which will suck up uh, more surplus labor, not just in countries like Europe, which, by the way, European growth may have picked up, but it's still below 2%, from under 1%. Well done. Uh, uh, US is crawling back towards 2%. The latest quarter figures are not very good. It's never got above 2% on average since 2008, uh, uh, 2010, to be more exact. Uh, so there hasn't been a recovery that can be recognized. And I think that's because profitability is too low. So um, the prognostication is that there has to be another slump to, drive down the costs of production and raise profitability to create the conditions for a new level of expansion. And there are, if that's sufficiently good and the working class is unable to resist uh, or over, overcome the power, political power of the capitalist class, we're heading for another major slump. I mean, can you imagine what this would mean after we, what we've just been through over the, over the period of the Great Recession and since then, that we have to have another one in order to create capitalism an opportunity for it to expand into new areas which still exist around the world for them to, to exploit. That prognostication I put in my graph that Jose presented where everything connected together fantastically well and dropped down into the corner at 2018. Uh, so if we come back here this time next year and the capitalism is booming everywhere at three or four percent a year, employment's up, Donald Trump's a hero, and uh, uh, the world is going forward and, and everything is looking great, then you can shred the book. <laughs> but more importantly, and more seriously, I'll go away and I'll reanalyze everything I've done in the book, or my arguments, and see where I've gone wrong, because that's the point, isn't it? To go back, not say, to go on blindly saying, no, it's a depression, it's a depression, when it clearly isn't. You, you have to reanalyze your, and scientifically and say, well, I've got it all wrong. I need to consider what I've done wrong. Maybe Paul's right, maybe Jose's right, maybe Owl's right. I've got to reconsider the whole process. And that, that seems to me the purpose of our, uh, the exercise of having these meetings and having these discussions. We want to learn more, grasp a better understanding so that we can be more effective in seeing what's going to happen. It's not a just a question of building e egos and writing books. So, when you put your That's statistics it. together, you post, mm -hmm. uh, let, let's call it a 1980. Yeah. Don't you think there was a dramatic change in 1980 yeah. with respect to leverage? The triple A's and double A's before 1980 are dramatically different for the Fortune 500 post-1980 because the leverage that they would allow after that, yeah. changed completely, and they took the money and moved it out of the corporation. So you got a lower level of profitability because the money went out to raise the stock price, but the capital stays on the balance sheet. So isn't isn't it 
a, a philosophical change that, that you're, uh, when you're comparing pre and post 1980, is that a fair uh, analysis? Well, clearly, something happened from the early 1980s onwards. Uh, the argument of the book, and I think other people, is that profitability had reached such a low level by the late 1970s that capitalism had to do something. And we know we now in what we call the, the neoliberal period, the solution was, first of all, crush the trade unions. Second, introduce all sorts of labor laws to boost the rate of surplus value. Privatize to get more profits for sectors, reduce the state sector. Uh, we, we can list a load of other, which globalization, one of the biggest factors, expansion of capital to exploit all new areas of labor which hadn't been brought into the capitalist process. This is a period of 30 years ago of the neoliberal is the phrase. Some people go to the point of saying that capitalism's changed into something else because of this. I don't think it's just a different period. It's when the counteracting factors against the tendency of the rate of profit to fall became dominant because of the political drive of the, of the capitalist elites and the failure of social democratic movements and the trade unions to defend the position that had been achieved in the previous period. And that included financialization expansion of financial assets but if you, as an if you took out those top corporations yeah. out of the stock market yeah. analysis the stock market went up it did and yeah. you're saying the profitability went down and no, no, not in that period.